Welcome back, folks. After a week and a half absence to the return of WrestleRant right here on the YouTube channel, I am Graham G.S. Matthews, and for the entire month of September, we are breaking down old Unforgiven pay-per-views as seen on the WWE Network, of course, starting today with the 1998 installment, The In Your House Show. So not a very good show. It had two saving graces. I thought it was okay. Um, definitely one of the better Attitude Era shows that I've seen. I mean, I've seen some pretty shitty reviews for the show. I enjoyed it for what it was. Maybe it gets better as it goes along. But nevertheless, let's kick off this review with a six-man tag team match opening the show between Farouk, Ken Shamrock, and Steve Blackman taking on The Nation, represented by Mark Henry, D'Lo Brown, and The Rock with uh, Kama Mustafa in their corner. So it was a decent match. I mean, the, ma the in-ring action... During the Attitude Era, which I just got finished talking about on Hashtag AskGSM just yesterday. Cheap plug if you want to check that out. The entering action during the Attitude Era was complete shit. Not to say every single match was terrible, but in their stories being told, I mean, that's exactly what it, This was a prime example of that. The entering action, more often than not, was complete crap. But, but, the stories that were being told between the competitors, because everyone on the roster had a story made this match somewhat watchable, in my opinion. Farouk was out for revenge against the Nation of Domination after they ousted him and The Rock took over. And then, I mean, Ken Shamrock and Steve Blackman were kind of just, you know, shoved, were kind of thrusted right into the uh, the picture here. They really didn't have much history, from what I saw anyway, with the Nation of Domination. But on, pa <clears throat> on paper, though, they made for a great team. Ken Shamrock and Steve Blackman, that's a kick-ass team right there. Didn't make the match any better from an in-ring standpoint because they didn't spend too much time in the ring. Um, so it was decent, decent for what it was. Farouk got his revenge, picked up the win for his team. He didn't really go anywhere after that as a single star before, you know, branching out a tag team competition once again with Bradshaw as the APA shortly thereafter. So, I mean, it, he, he got his comeuppance, or he gave uh, the nation their comeuppance, and that was kind of fun for what it was. Not a great in-ring action classic, not an in-ring classic here, but for the story they told, I thought it was fine. After that, for the European Championship, Triple H taking on Owen Hart with the special stipulation that China, part of D-Generation X also, much like Triple H and the New Age Outlaws and X-Pac at that time, had to be hanging from a cage above the ring or the side of the ring, whatever. This was one of those Vince Russo bullshit stipulations, something we would see very similar to in TNA multiple times. That can name a number of occasions I saw something similar similar to this in TNA over the years that was undoubtedly a Vince Russo creation when you lock someone up in a cage or ringside and then go up. Um, and not even are they locked in a cage or ringside, they are you know, ascended up in the air. And Shiny here, to kind of make the stipulation completely worthless, escaped the cage and was hanging from the cage at one point where she could have fallen down and gotten hurt. And it looked like she was legitimately calling for help when she was dank from the when, when she was dangling from the top of the cage. I'm sure it was planned, but it looked very, very, very dangerous. Maybe it's just me. I have no idea, but it looked like it was a scary spot. Thankfully, she got uh, she got her way down, and someone the, the cage started going out. She was probably waiting when she was hanging there, when she was dangling from the top of the cage, for someone to finally pull it down. And in the end, it was Road Dog, also a part of Degeneration X, as I previously established. So I think that spot may have taken longer than it should have, but um, thus saving her life, and that distracted the referees. Triple H took advantage, and with some help from China and X-Pac, who I also believe got involved, Triple H retains the European Championship against Owen Hart. So all the shenanigans, all the bullshit aside, it was a really good match. I believe a WrestleMania rematch from the month prior. Um, but yeah, really good match, and one of the two saving graces on this show, in my opinion, a very well-wrestled match. You can never really have an, a bad match, per se, with Owen Hart, in my opinion. So, really good stuff from these two here, uh, you know, with the shenanigans aside. But that was kind of to be expected in the Attitude Era, so not many points taken off of that. After that, a complete dud of a match between the new Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express. They were trying to kind of reignite an old rivalry from years earlier in the North Carolina area. I believe this was emanating from North Carolina. Let me just double check here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, North Carolina, uh, Greensboro, G Greensboro, North Carolina. So they were trying to reignite an old rivalry on this show between the two teams. It wasn't even the original members. The Rock and Roll Express was the original members, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson. Um, but the new Midnight Express was not the same people. It was Bodacious Bar and Bombastic Bob, later known as Bob Holly in WWE. I mean, the match wasn't even that bad. It was just a complete waste of time. It was obviously no one cared about it, despite the grand homecoming, quote-unquote, that the Rock and Roll Express was supposed to be getting on this show. Jim Cornette's presence was supposed to make this feud feel more 
uh, nostalgic, I guess, and you know they weren't even the same original two members as the Midnight Express. So why even bother? No one gave two shits about this match. The new Mid the new Midnight Express in the end picked up the win with some help from Jim Cornette from ringside. A complete waste of a match, and all it was also for the NWA World Tag Team Titles. The new Midnight Express successfully retained the gold, but it, it was a dud of a match. No one gave a shit at all. After that, an evening gown match between Luna Vachon and Sable. Your typical women's match that you would get in the Attitude Era. I'm not complaining, you know, anyone who would be complaining seeing, you know, Sable stripped from her evening gown. I mean, that was a sight for sore eyes, but, um, you know, still, it, it, it was entertaining in that respect. But other than that, though, it was a complete waste of a match. Went all of three minutes. The match itself was complete shit from an in-ring standpoint. Like I said, very typical of the Attitude Era, so it's not like I was shocked by, by what I was seeing from an in-ring standpoint. <laughs> Maybe from Sable's standpoint, but from an in-ring standpoint, I was not shocked by, uh, the complete lack of entering action, whatever. I was kind of, I kind of knew what I was getting in for, getting into. That doesn't really make it any much that much better, you know. But still, it's kind of a dead of a match. Luna Vachon wins the match, and she gets stripped afterwards anyway. So what the hell was the point of that? Um, but again, not going to complain about seeing Sable get stripped. There is that, uh, there is that saving grace of it as well. After that, for the WWF Tag Team Titles, we have the New Age Outlaws defending the gold against LOD 2000. I've seen some pretty bad reviews for this match. I didn't think it was that bad. I'm not saying it was a great match. The LOD 2000 was not nearly what they would have been, you know, what they what they were in their original run, but they were still pretty good. They tried to kind of make them mean something again. They gave them Sonny as their manager. I enjoyed it. From all the times I've seen them in past pay-per-views, I enjoyed them. So maybe in the, I'm in the minority there. Like I said, not the LOD of old, but at least they were trying to kind of reinvent themselves going into the new millennium. The New Age Outlaws... Also, just got finished talking about this on um, on hashtag AskGSM yesterday. I cannot recall one great New Age Outlaws match. The guys were never known for their in-ring skills. Billy Gunn is a very underrated athlete. Road Dog is very entertaining. He's a great mic worker, much like Enzo Amore from NXT. But together, they are not the greatest in-ring tag team. Very entertaining. Sure, they were over as gangbusters on the show. Kind of. This was kind of early on into their run, they had just joined DX, so they were still trying to get over with the audience, um, but other than that, though, I mean, it was not a great match at all, like I said, I enjoyed it for the two teams involved, in the end, the New Age Outlaws ultimately retained, still the World Tag Team, WWF Tag Team Champions, whatever you want to call them, um, also from interference from DX, so this was essentially the D-Generation X show, with New Age Outlaws, you had Triple H retaining it, this was the DX show, with everyone interfering in each other's matches, so... Um, not a great match. It you know for the time they were given, it could have been better, but it wasn't completely terrible in my opinion. So after that, we had the Undertaker taking on Kane in the first ever Inferno match. So we had history made on this show with Undertaker and Kane. So that was pretty cool. Um, I mean, it was definitely not their best outing. It's not like Undertaker and Kane have contested five star classics before. I can't remember one great, truly great match these two have ever had against each other. But, I mean, I thought it was interesting. I'm not, not to say it was a really good match, but for the first time ever Inferno stipulation, I've never really liked the stipulation. I thought the Kane-Wyatt match, the, the Kane-Bray Wyatt match from SummerSlam 2013 was kind of poop. Um, but this was a lot better. I thought the intensity was there. The stipulation was a lot better. I don't, I don't think it was a botch when Kane got tossed over the top rope and he wasn't caught on fire, so he just walked off. And Undertaker ultimately got himself out of the fire, and he had to push him into the side of the ring. They kind of escaped the stipulation in that respect. They kind of cheated this side of that. I mean, still, someone got caught on fire, so it wasn't, you know, a complete waste. Um, but there was that respect, you know, there was that essence of it as well. I mean, even the newer, the, they called it a ring of fire match at, at SummerSlam 2013. You had to pin your opponent in the middle of the ring. It wasn't making them, you know, get, light them on fire. It was completely different. So, And even Kane wasn't like, it's not like he was completely torched up, you know, as he was going for something, Undertaker pushed him back, and his arm very gently, you know, hit the apron, and he caught on fire, and that was about it, so kind of anticlimactic, I mean, it's not like you're going to see him get lit up anyway, so it wasn't really um, what you would expect, I mean, it's, it's not even that it was PG, it's PG-14, but, I mean, realistically speaking, the guy would have got a lot more hurt than he was if he got completely lit up, so then why even book the stipulation to begin with, you know what I mean? But for what it was, I enjoyed it for the first time ever. For the first ever Inferno match, it served its purpose and kind of a spectacle more than it was a classic, so to speak. And then we get to the main event. Hands down the best match in the entire show. Stone Cold Steve Austin, one month removed from winning that WWF Championship at WrestleMania 15 against The Rock, defending the gold against Dude Love on this show. 
Dude Love, who had just sold out to the corporation, Mr. McMahon, whatever, contending with the gold on this show as a heel. Really, really good match. A lot of back and forth action. Again, a lot of interference, a lot of shenanigans, as the Attitude Era was known for. But unlike in previous matches on this show, it worked to their advantage. A lot of interference from Vince, and he did not really get all that physical at that period in time. He got thwacked by Stone Cold right in the head with a steel chair um, after, Dude Love moved, after Dude Love moved. And there was kind of come some question at the end of the show as to whether Stone Cold did it on purpose or whatever. He delivered a stunner to the referee. Ultimately, that would get himself disqualified. So he retained the championship, although Dude Love won via DQ, which is not the title. To close off the show after Stone Cold walked out and Dude Love walked out as well, we had uh, Mr. McMahon being stretchered out of the arena for a couple minutes after he was, like I said, taken out by Stone Cold with that chair shot. Pretty vicious chair shot, too. Um, you stretchered out of the arena and... Kind of a question mark going the next night's Raw as to whether this condition was and what it would mean for Stone Cold's reign as WWE Champion. But even even from an in-ring standpoint, I thought it was a very well-wrestled match. Stone Cold, I do love, had a lot of great in-ring chemistry and that really showed here. So a lot of awesome action involved in this match. Kind of trading in the back-and-forth finishers. And the interference from Vince, that was very well done. I mean, like I said, it was kind of expected with all the interference and the shenanigans. It was the Attitude Era. Not expecting anything less from this company watching a pay-per-view from 1998. But, in this respect, though, given the story they were trying to tell, I thought it was very well done. I thought it was, hands down, undoubtedly, the best bout in the entire show. So that closed out, Unforgiven, In Your House, 1998. Definitely not a great show whatsoever. I would not recommend you watch it back. You know, honestly, I mean, obviously, the only one true match you should be watching back from this show was Dude Love versus Stone Cold for the WWF title. If you have time, check out Triple H and Owen Hart. Wasn't a huge fan of the finish. It protected Owen. Um, just a lot of crazy and uh, cra crazy interference and stipulation in the cage. I thought it was stupid, but you know, still the match from a wrestling standpoint, that was really, really good. So check that out. Ma check that match out if you have the time. Everything else was just kind of crap. You had a 20-minute promo from Vince in the middle of the ring just to kill time. That was kind of pointless and stupid. Um, but yeah, that was Unforgiven 1998. Not easily not the greatest installment I've seen. Better Unforgiven in recent years. So I'm looking forward to watching those back and reviewing them. So like I said earlier, be sure to you know stay tuned here on WrestleRant for the remainder of the month of September. The entire month is dedicated to old Unforgiven pay-per-views. For the next couple weeks, I'll be reviewing Unforgiven pay-per-views on Saturdays and Sundays due to how I kind of backed it up. And I was going to be doing the Unforgiven pay-per-view reviews on Tuesdays starting last week, but you know SummerSlam happened, and I'm going back to school today. Um, I'm actually recording this on Sunday, but uh, you know going up on Tuesday, I, I should be having. All my Unforgiven reviews go up on Tuesday, Saturday, starting the Saturday and Sunday as well. So be sure to come back on Saturday for my full review of Unforgiven 1999 as seen on the WWE Network. So in the meantime and in between time, guys, be sure to find me on Twitter and follow me there at WrestleRant. Find me on Facebook. Find me on Facebook rather. Give the page an old thumbs up at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. And also be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. Like I said, guys, I'll catch you right back here on Saturday with my view of Unforg Unforgiven 1999. Till then, guys, I'm Graham Jusa Matthews, and I'll catch you down the road.